Chapter 21 All night Duncan had slept, having been dragged by his friends into a tent. On waking he had quickly been greeted and ushered into another tent where there was an injured boy tied up. It was one of the two boys that had not been freed of the magic, the one that had been thrown into the air with a lot of rocks. They had tied him up as he was still trying to follow his final order, to kill them all. Duncan needed to free him from the goblin magic. Looking at the cuts and bruises that covered the boy, Duncan tried to shake off the thought that it had been him. He had done this to the boy using magic, and had done far worse to the other boy, along with Dak Bear. Pushing those memories aside, Duncan tried to concentrate and free the boy. It was difficult as the boy kept writhing, doing everything in his power to follow his final order and kill Duncan. But Duncan would not give up, and eventually the magical prison crumbled enough for the boy's mind to burst free. The writhing stopped and the boy, past the point of exhaustion from injuries combined with the night of attempting to follow an impossible order, whispered a thank you as he fell into a deep sleep. Duncan spent much of his day with Charlie and Finn, while the five newly freed boys celebrated. The three thirteen-year-olds took a few walks around the camp, sitting at the campfire occasionally, but mostly their day was spent in discussion. Sam and the other boys would join them for short periods. Among them all was a split of opinion over what to do next. Sam and Boy too, Duncan hadn't learned their names yet, were adamant that it was their duty to free all the other soldier boys and bring down Umkra and his goblin armies. Charlie and Boy One only wanted to find a way to go home. Finn pointed out that they didn't know how to get home, so freeing other boys and building their own army might be the best option, quoting the idea of safety in numbers. The other boys didn't seem to care about much other than the fact that they were free, struggling to believe that their dream had come true. Duncan knew the decision was down to him, for without him there was no option to free the other boys. He did want to free others, as many as possible, but it was dangerous. At one order from a goblin, anyone that they were trying to free would try to kill them. If Duncan agreed to the idea of trying to rescue more boys, it could result in all of them getting killed. It felt like a lot of responsibility. When Duncan explained his thoughts to Sam that evening, Sam seemed to be amused. As far as Sam was concerned, it was not Duncan's decision. Sam was going to attempt to rescue other boys anyway. If Duncan didn't want to come, perhaps Duncan could give Sam the ring? Or if Duncan didn't want to give over the ring, Sam would still try. He would see if there was another way. Maybe, he said, if we kill Pelkar then all the boys that he put the spell on might be freed. Either way, me and at least some of the others will do our best. It will be dangerous, and we might fail. But I think if you all come with us, help us, then we have a much better chance. So that seemed to be the decision made. If Duncan chose not to try and free the other boys, they would still try and almost certainly die. If he went with them, they at least had a chance. It suddenly felt very clear what was the right course of action. So, where will we go? asked Duncan. How far to another camp like this one? Sam thought for a moment before answering. The nearest camp is south, half a day's march. But the main camps, and Pelkar, are north. He spat the name Pelkar, full of hate. We will head north, investigating smaller camps on the way and liberating them if we can. We'll leave in the morning. The injured boy was not fit enough and two of the boys had volunteered to stay with him. The remaining six of them left the camp, marching north. Duncan felt positive. First, he had been the only free human in this world. Then, he had freed Charlie and Finn, becoming three. Now, he was one of six boys on a quest to save the rest. Sam led the way, but he did not set a punishing pace, and they had plenty of food from the camp's supplies. All day they walked, keeping to the lowest slopes of the foothills that skirted the Colossus mountain range. Apparently, the Mokhtar Mountains was where the main training camps and Pelkar, the mage goblin that had created the boy soldiers, could be found. Sam explained that, in preparation for the attack on the fairies, there were camps dotted along the edge of the mountain range that served as a border between fairy and goblin lands. They slept amid a stand of pine trees, fallen needles creating a dry and relatively soft ground for them to lay their blankets on. Sunrise revealed a strange blue smear on the horizon to the north, Duncan asked about it, and one of the boys, Boy 2, explained that it was the smoke from the Blue Mountain. The Blue Mountain, he elaborated, was a huge volcano, the highest mountain in the Colossus mountain range, and it constantly belched a stream of bluish smoke. 
but it was still several days' march to the north. The smoke from the mountain could be seen for many miles, especially if the wind was blowing in your direction. They ate a breakfast of some sort of biscuit, along with a strange fruit called a grubot. It looked like a sort of blue banana, but was much chewier. Duncan thought it tasted like a cross between a giant raisin and some sort of cheese. It was neither delicious nor disgusting, falling somewhere in the middle. But they were at least quite filling, and set the boys up nicely for their morning of marching. Just before lunch, they saw a thin column of smoke rising in the distance. That will be the cook fire of the next camp, stated Sam. The six boys gathered, standing close to hold a discussion. What's the plan this time? asked Charlie. Duncan wasn't sure if the question was directed toward him or Sam. Many of the boys, including Sam, seemed to view Duncan as their leader. But Duncan was inexperienced in this world, in war, in goblin behaviours, and every other thing that would be useful to know in order to make a good plan. So he waited for Sam to answer. I've been thinking about that a lot. The whole time we've been marching, he began. I think that we learned a lot from last time with Dak Bear. This time we need to neutralise the goblins before we start freeing the boys. But how easy that is will depend on how many goblins there are in the camp. The camps along the mountains were built to have about mm, 100 boys and between 5 and 10 goblins. However, the havoc caused following the retreat from the fairies and their demon means it could be many more, or many less. We won't know until we get there, but I think that some things we did last time went well. Walking into the camp openly with a simple story is still a good option. I think we should try to stick to the truth where we can. So our story is that the six of us returned from our camp following the battle in the fairy forest. But no goblins made it back with us. So we have walked here to get orders. That's all we say. There were nods all round. Then Finn asked, What then? What if there are lots of goblins in the camp? Then Boy Five questioned, What if they're disciplined and the goblins actually take shifts on watch? It's more likely this close to fairylands. Sam bit his lip at this potential problem. He just shrugged, though. If it gets more complicated, we'll have to come up with a better plan once we're in the camp. But I'm not going to walk on by and leave boys enslaved by goblins, not when we have Duncan's ring and the ability to free them. A few hours later, Duncan found himself walking straight into an enemy camp for the second time in four days. With Sam leading, the six of them walked towards the camp, which had a very rough fence made of tree branches. A gap in the fence, guarded by one boy, served as the gate for which they were heading. They were attempting to affect an air of being tired and depressed, with their eyes down and their feet dragging a little. They were just six more soldiers coming to join the camp. The boy guarding the entrance to the camp watched their approach with indifference. When they reached him, he probably wouldn't have said a word had Sam not spoken to him. Are there goblins in command of this camp? The guard looked surprised at the question, but answered without hesitation. Of course. There are three goblins here. They're having their dinner at the moment, so you should just wait for them to finish before making your report. They nodded and carried on into the camp. There were more boys in this camp than in Sam's, but it didn't appear to be anywhere near full. There were three small tents in the camp, with one larger one. The largest tent had two boys standing outside, and Duncan assumed that the goblins were in there. The rest of the camp was made up of poorly constructed huts, built over scrappy-looking blankets which must be where the boys slept. The huts didn't look like they would offer very much protection from the rain. There was a clearing in the camp with a large log that looked like it could serve as a bench. The boys sat down on it and waited. When a single boy walked past carrying an armful of firewood, Sam waved at him and asked, How many boys are in this camp? The boy answered, Twenty-nine before you arrived. He did not slow down, intent on following his orders, and was quickly out of sight again. Duncan was concerned by the number. If one of the goblins did give the order to attack us, what can we do against nearly thirty attackers? But they were already in the camp, and it was too late to go back without raising suspicion. When a goblin did finally appear from the tent, it looked at them with disgust and demanded, What are you boys doing just sitting idly? Led by Sam's example, the six of them leapt to their feet as Sam began his practiced response. We are new to the camp. We've come from a camp to the south where we were left with no goblin leadership following the attack against the fairies. We have marched here to get new orders. The goblin sneered at them. Mm, of course, you humans are too stupid to last very long on your own. Replacement boys is good. 
We have been short of soldiers since the attack. Are there any more coming? No, answered Sam. We're all that return to our camp after the battle against the fairies. Hmm, pity. Speak to the other humans and find some work to do. We allow all humans to speak in this camp. Then the goblin, with his screeching, whiny voice, was walking past them. Remembering that until they had freed the boys of this camp, they had to maintain their cover, they began to follow their orders. They moved as a group to find some other boys to talk to. They found one heading toward the gate and asked what he was doing. He informed them that he was going into some nearby woods to collect some branches to add to the camp's fence. It offered an easy task that would give them a chance to speak without being overheard, so they joined the boy, following him out of the camp towards some trees. As they went, he asked where they had come from, and Sam repeated his rehearsed story. Once out of earshot of the camp, Duncan asked their guide, So, as goblins go, what are the ones here like? The boy answered in an easy tone, seeming cheerful to be outside of the camp. Mm, interesting question, actually. Two of them are typical goblins, don't care much about anything but themselves and gaining as much power as they can, and they see us boys as a useful tool with nothing more. But one of them, Roptek, he's quite different. Have you met him? He's the one with only one arm and scars on his face. They all shook their heads. The boy continued, Well, years ago, he was nearly killed in one of the battles against one of the goblin clans, a clan that's now defeated and subdued. Anyway, two boys under his command fought hard and stopped him from being killed instantly. But more than that, they dragged him to safety and gave him some basic first aid, kept him alive. He was grateful to them. Maybe the only goblin to ever be grateful to a human. Since then, he's treated boys much more fairly and respectfully than any other goblins I've met. He makes sure that we get enough food, and he makes sure that all the boys in the camp are allowed to talk. Is he in command of the camp? asked Duncan. Unfortunately not, the boy spoke freely. He's the second in command. Roptek is a respected warrior which is important among goblins. Even before King Umkra started his conquest with the use of human boys, Roptek had already earned a fearful reputation, or at least that's what I've been told. But his favourable treatment of us boys seems to have done his prospects little good, and he's been skipped over for command several times. The two boys that saved Roptek's life have since been killed in the endless battles that have fought in Umkra's name, but Roptek acts a bit like he owes us all a favour. It's good for us at least. Having him in the camp has made this the best post I've had in this realm. Before Roptek joined the camp, there were boys literally starving to death. As they reached the trees and the boy began collecting wood, Duncan indicated that the six of them should find a quiet space where, in whispers, they agreed their plan for the night.